so let's now that we've got an understanding of that let's look at how we can support Mila through prompting hopefully this next slide or this slide looks familiar this is the prompting hierarchy we've shared in recent trainings and this graphic shows different types of prompts and kind of a general flow of how they might work. It all depends on the student and the skill you're working on. There isn't a one-stop shop for prompting. So the important piece for teachers to know is the type of prompt and how they work together. Um, as we design prompting, we wanna make sure that it's a thought full process um, and that it's individualized to students. The goal of using a prompt is to get your student to the correct answer with as little intrusion as possible. We have to change the level of the prompt if it doesn't work. So if we start with one type of prompt and that doesn't work, the student is not successful, then we have to change that prompt level. I'm sure you've all heard the definition of insanity as doing the same thing over and over, expecting different results. Not us. We need to reflect and make those changes to the prompting levels. So the next slide, we're going to look at a least to most hierarchy tailored to the production of sounds in a small group phonics lesson. So, like I said, some students may not be able to pr produce those sounds. They can often identify the letters and the sound. They just may have trouble producing the sound because of speech or articulation difficulties. These difficulties may be due to anatomical, physiological, or even neurological deficits, and hearing loss is also a factor. If there is an expectation for the reader to produce sounds, we have to consider these articulation difficulties. And we also want to remember that the goal of a reading program is learning to read. Um, difficulties with articulation need to be accommodated and alternative means of sound production should be considered. We have to think about using visuals and providing models when prompting. In this hierarchy, we start at the top with independent visuals. So that might look like a classroom sound wall and all the students have access to that. It might be pictures of the sounds being made, lips pictures. That also could be a visual prompt that those sound pictures could be brought down. So when if students have vision impairment like Mila and she can't see that sound wall, then she has that right there at the table with her. The next level is just a verbal only prompt. It's usually an auditory cue when the adult produces the sound like E or might tell the student how to make the sound. We smile when we say the E sound. Or we open our mouth more when we say the ah sound. Next, we have a visual only prompt, which might be just holding up that handheld picture from the sound wall to let the students see that. A gesture prompt might be that the teacher shows the student the correct placement of the tongue, lips, teeth, and gives a description. When, when they give the description, that's pairing it with a verbal prompt. So you might use your hands to say, remember we smile when we say the is sound, or you might even help the student move their mouth into that place. Or you might even describe what the sound is like, like it's a lip popper or it's the snake sound. That could also be paired as a visual verbal or a gesture verbal prompt. And then the last one that I think we fall back on and that Mr. Accord really used a lot is the model where the adult shows the student how to make the sound, verbally describes it, and then pairs that with a gesture pointing to the mouth. Some people use a mirror like in this 
picture here. So one thing I want to talk about is approximations too, that um, approximations can be accepted, especially when blending the sounds together, because that can cause what, what speech pathologists refer to as co-articulation. I think it's very similar to blending, but the co-articulation of the sounds when the m, a, t come together and they blend together, it's may be difficult for the person listening to understand what the student says. So when Mila said s, e, t, she got all the sounds correct in isolation. But when he asked her to blend it together and say sit, it came out. Uh, she could make the sounds in isolation, but struggled to put them together. So that's when he accepted the approximation. When the speech pathologist pushes in, who knows what might happen, but hopefully we'll contribute to adding some additional prompts. Um, and some of those might be a physical or a tact, what we might call a tactile prompt uh, using a tongue depressor or something. There's something called speech buddy tools that are different tools for different sounds. Or we might have the student position uh, on the floor or on an exercise ball um, in order for them to focus on producing a particular sound. Um, in addition, the speech pathologist might bring in a speech generating device that allows the student to express the sound and the word in a different way. Some of those devices have a phonetic keyboard that allow for sound and then blending the sound together.